yes, I'm I'm very delighted to have been invited to this um, lecture series, and I appreciate very much the two previous uh, lecturers, uh, which have uh, given excellent presentations that I can today with my lecture build on, um, which. Uh, Today, I focus on the risk from climate extremes in the Anthropocene. And um, I thought with a very general um, introduction about our planet and our life, as uh, it has been also seen in, in Greg's article in Nature in 2013, is that our society and we as people, we are very much uh, focusing our well-being on a flourishing economy that is seen as very successful if it's ever growing. Uh, so growth is very important. Often we forget in this that our life support system is also our planet. We are depending on functioning uh, um, ecosystems and a more or less stable climate. But this life support system is not ever growing. We have uh, such to say, uh, planetary boundaries, which have been uh, described in Steffen at our science article, who picked up about uh, seven uh, planetary boundaries that uh, we are, some of them are about to cross or we are have already crossed. And one of, of these planetary boundaries is climate change, as you see here. And we have transitioned already from green from a safe space to a zone of uncertainty, increasing risks. And there's other boundaries that we are facing with our life support system regarding to biodiversity, to nutrients. And we have heard last lecture uh, that also new um, um, material or, or elements that we as humans introduce into the planet, like plastic or nuclear materials, uh, they are challenging our our planet and a part of the Anthropocene. So, but here today, I, I want to mainly focus on climate change and this transitioning from green to yellow, increasing risk and uncertainty. And our climate uh, is basically the complex interaction between the different spheres of our Earth system. That is the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the cryosphere, the land, the biosphere. And also in the Anthropocene, as we learned, the humans play a very important role in shaping our climate because we are burning uh, forests, we are deforesting, we are uh, putting greenhouse gases and other gases in the atmosphere. We are building uh, and uh, every place <laughs> on earth and we are uh, also we have uh, we do animal breeding and pasture and all of that is changing uh, our climate because we are affecting one or more of the the, the spheres of this uh, complex system so the climate is not of course everywhere the same on our planet we have very cold zones we have very hot zones um and Basically, we humans, we have accomplished to almost uh, inhabit most I mean, every corner of this, of this area, despite having very much extremes, extreme climates, like in the polar regions, we have managed to survive. We live in, in, in rainforest environments. We live in tundras or savannas. Uh, we live in deserts. Even we found ways to survive and also in, in island states. So the, the humans have, of course, adapted to various types of climates on this planet. But overall, uh, the climate uh, in itself has been more or less uh, stable over the times that societies have developed in this climate that we experience today. So, but, and when we look uh, at these different climates, uh, in the tropics or the polar regions or Central Europe, we have weather and every uh, the weather for every climate zone is different. 
and and people are adapted to this kind of weather and uh, like for instance now we have very cold weather and this is maybe a little bit colder than usually but it's a typical january for for uh, for norway but in other regions if we were now in italy this is extreme weather so so uh, it, depending where we live we are adapted to the weather and the climate is basically the average over the weather condition um, uh, uh, across a time period and uh, at a specific place. So that is our climate we experience where we are adjusted to. And then what are the uh, extremes in that sense? That's something if you just very general from the term uh, uh, in the dictionary, it's something that uh, is uh, very great very unusual, exceptional, serious I think, thing that happens or takes place, especially one of importance. So given from the climate in our region where we are adjusted to, an extreme is something very unusual. In the climate science, we have that more technical framing. So an extreme event is the occurrence of a value or of a, a, of a weather variable, for instance, temperature, above or below a threshold value near the upper or lower ends of a range of its observed value in a specific region. So meaning if we have our temperature distribution, uh, which you see in the, in the left uh, graph, um, that we have thresholds that are not often crossed. Like if we have in, in Norway now in the winter, if it's minus 15 degrees or below, that would be more or less extreme. And the same for a summer that is above 30 or 25 degrees is extreme. So, um, and then we also look at return periods in that sense. It's, it's the average interval such a uh, threshold is exceeded. We, we know the expression 100 year flood or 1000 year flood. And the rarer it is, the more extreme it is. Um, so, but these, uh, definitions, it of course holds for today's climate, we experience extreme weather. And but in the future, we shifting our climate, our mean temperature to warmer climate. So that's what you see illustrated in, in this figure. And the more we shift the climate to warmer climate, that to warmer temperature, we see that we uh, some of the thresholds that were on the uh, colder side, they are less uh, more likely, so we have uh, less cold extreme. But on the other side, we have more and more hot extremes because our um, threshold is shifted to the to the outer tail. So that's what we just say as the tails of the distribution are changing. Uh, so this is what a very technical in terms of what happens in a in a warmer climate. And what and we do see that the, and we have heard it from the previous speakers that we uh, we are changing the climate the, chi the climate is changing and here in this figure you see the past 2000 years and uh, the where the climate was um, more or less stable there were cold periods there were hot periods warmer periods there's a wriggling of this temperature average temperature over the globe but then in the last uh, in since the um since the uh, industrial Phase, we see that the temperatures are increasing in an unprecedented manner. And now if we zoom in to this industrial period since the 1880s, we see that the with the increase of CO2 concentration, which is the blue line, we see also that the temperatures have become more and more warmer compared to the pre-industrial climate. So we are much warmer than it was before the uh, pre-industrial times. Um, and so this is, this is how uh, some of our climate uh, scientists colleagues try to make it more visible, more fashionable, uh, what is happening. This is a, uh, the, the warming stripe showing basically the same uh, uh, concept uh, Basically, all the years that are blue are colder than the average of uh, the, the pre-industrial climate, and the, towards the right, we're going to warmer climate. We, we it has become a very uh, fashionable 
uh, design uh, over the course of the last years and um, indicating it is getting warmer and, and in every place uh, uh, on this uh, on, on land basically. So, um, and we also, I mean, this is very abstract, but we also feel it. I mean, we have experience, especially in Europe, we have experienced major heat waves in the last two decades uh, where records have been broken. Like for instance, uh, uh, just uh, uh, in recent 2018, where we had like 45 degrees in France. Uh, and then these kind of events, these heat wave events are more and more uh, cases where we can really say we can attribute the effect or the, the, the contribution of climate change to the heat wave. It really was the human influence that made these heat waves hotter. It wouldn't have been so hot without the climate change. So we have attribution studies uh, uh, saying here really climate change is contributing and making our heat waves more extreme. But we're not only seeing heat waves uh, and more and more becoming extreme. Uh, we're seeing major flooding in several parts of the uh, planet. You also in, uh, in, in, in Norway, uh, we see droughts in, in different areas of the, we see major forest fires like in California or Australia that make the news. And we, see, we often hear from tropical cyclones, hurricanes, typhoons that hit different areas of the, of the world. Um, so, so we are there, we, we, we see, we hear it in the news, uh, and some of these extremes have really been attributed to climate change. But it, that's the hazard part. I mean, this is, okay, the weather is getting more extreme. But it's not only the weather. I mean, as I said, we are adapted to certain uh, climates and extremes. But what it really makes a, a, a risk from extremes is we, uh, if, if we count into our vulnerability and how we are exposed to these weather extremes. And so an, an extreme event cannot be seen only as the weather extreme, but it's a rare event with high impact. So it's also the impact that makes us worry and, and cause the disaster risk or risk for disaster. So that is basically catch, captured also in numbers uh, in, in recent statistics from the reinsurance company here, the Munich Re, that counted uh, natural catastrophe loss events worldwide here in 2019 with US dollar in billions from hurricanes, floods, heat waves, droughts, wildfires all over the world. And here, this is uh, where the uh, NOAA office in the US uh, just shows the uh, 2020 billion dollar uh, climate and weather related disasters related to hurricanes, droughts, heat waves, uh, severe weather. And uh, the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction has in their 20 year review shown that 90% of all disasters worldwide are weather related. And the most hit the US, China, India, Philippines, Indonesia. The weather related means floods, storms, extreme temperature, droughts, uh, wildfire. And it's not just the, the dollar amounts, the, basically the, the properties that are lost, but it's also the people. In some areas, there's not so much valuable property like in the US, but they'll, they'll, there's a lot of people living, like for instance, in India, in Africa, uh, and so that is also to be uh, considered. Um, so, so we're seeing damages, we're seeing losses, and we know 90% are weather related. Now we are concerned, how is the weather, how is the climate changing and with it the weather extreme? So for that purpose, we have the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is an international body for assessing science related to climate change. It was set up in 1988 by the World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations uh, Environmental Program to provide policymakers with regular assessments of the scientific basis of climate change and its impact and future risk, and to give options for adaptation and mitigation. This uh, panel provides the scientific basis for governments at all levels to develop climate-related policies 
that underlie the negotiations at the UN climate conferences. And these are called uh, the conferences of the parties, the COP. They happen every year. And one famous one you may have heard of is the COP21 in Paris that came up then with the Paris Agreement to keep the global warming, the climate warming below 1.5 degree to really avoid dangerous climate change. And I will elaborate a little bit more on that. So the last IPCC report was in uh, 2013 and 14. There are four different reports, the physical basis, the impact of adaptation, and the working group three on the mitigation and the synthesis report. Currently, we're working on the sixth assessment report. I am author of the working group one, and we are finishing the report in a, a few weeks, and it will appear hopefully in January 2021. Um, so risk from climate change in the IPCC have been framed in this complex uh, uh, um, or in this kind of framing of uh, risk is the interaction between the hazards, weather and climate, vulnerability and exposure. And the working group one specifically, uh, specifically works with the weather and the changes and uh, the contribution from human green, uh, climate change. And then the working group two works on the development of issues uh, and climate change adaptation. And uh, we had a special report in 2012, which focused particularly on the managing risk of extreme events and disasters, a combination of both working groups. So here in this framing of the IPCC, the risk is the probability of events or trends times the consequences. And the probability of events or trends like heat waves, storms, uh, floods, is part of the climate, uh, the working group one on the climate side, physical. And then the, the consequences are part of working group two. But there's a really important connection that uh, is not that straightforward. And I have, as uh, uh, Osla already said, I have uh, edited a book where we highlight how, what are the different methodologies that are used to quantify impact, to link hazards with impacts and risk in different sectors, and how it's important to think transdisciplinary, to work interdisciplinary. And what um, the, uh, and here, I'm just giving you a short uh, insight in what has been uh, assessed in the fifth assessment, the last assessment report, uh, in terms of the climate extremes in the changing climate. And uh, this was from the chapter on observation. And what we have seen already is that we see changes in heavy precipitation events all over the land areas. We see droughts in some regions increase, some uh, areas droughts decrease. We see on in most or in all um, land areas, hot days and nights, warm spells and heat waves have been increasing in the last decades and cold days have been reduced or in decreased. And we see stronger tropical cyclones in the North Atlantic. And these are the kind of figures you see then in the chapters on the projection, the future trends of climate extremes. Here we work with scenarios, as you see on the, the right side, we have high emission scenarios where we assume there's lots of uh, fossil fuel burning in the future. and um, or we, we assume moderate or low emission scenarios, depending on the policies we, we're going to implement. And if we assume a high emission scenario, then you see a world that is warming strongly, like in some areas, like in the northern latitudes, the coldest uh, nights become up to 11 degrees hotter in the worst case scenario, which is, uh, which is alarming. And uh, also the warmest days, the summer temperatures, become much warmer in the continent. And depending on what pathways uh, we take, we see the different blue, red, and uh, yellow, light blue curves. We, we have a stronger warming or we have a lower warming, of course. And also over the, um, in the precipitation extremes, we see similar trends. So we're picking up, when you look at the left uh, graph, we're picking up from the, uh, historical uh, period, which is the uh, black line, to the increases 
very strong with the high emission scenarios and not and a little bit, but not so strong uh, precipitation increases in the in the lower emission scenarios. But overall, you see most of the areas over land are affected by increased heavy precipitation. And the next uh, plot, next slide shows drought areas. Uh, the increase in or the changes in consecutive dry days in indicator for drought uh, are div different. So we see some areas in the future will become much drier, like the Mediterranean, like Australia, and some areas will have reduction in drought. So this is just to give you an impression what, what uh, could, uh, how the assessment in the IPCC report looks and what we see in terms of major changes in extremes, the higher uh, our emissions or the higher the mean temperatures are going. So now I'm moving from this hazard perspective, uh, increase in temperature and precipitation to uh, the, uh, more what is assessed in the uh, working group two on the impact and adaptation. And here you again, you see a time series from the 1900s with observed global mean temperature, this is not extreme, this is the now the mean temperature, and you have the extreme scenario in red going up to five degree warmer world, and the blue low emission scenario uh, staying below two degrees basically. And associated with that, the uh, working group two has done an ass assessment in terms of reason for concern. So they have established five different categories where we are concerned what, that they could be uh, under risk from having severe impacts from climate change. And among those are the extreme weather events. And we already see, if, if you look at um, the blue line and the, you go over from the two degrees, we are all already in a high risk from climate, climate extremes, even if we stay below two degrees, because we have committed already to a certain degree of warming and to a certain level of change in the climate extreme. So in addition to really invest in mitigating, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we need to invest in adaptation because we will see more extreme weather in, in the years to come. Um, and this is, uh, this is uh, also captured in this special re report that came after the Paris Agreement to assess why it's worth to stay below 1.5 and not just two degrees, uh, which was previously said, uh, uh, it's, uh, the, the warming should be, stay below two degrees. So what makes the difference between one and, uh, one and a half and two degrees? Is it really, does it matter? Um, and yes, it does matter because this uh, graph shows you temperature extremes, wet extremes, dry extremes for different regions. These are the uh, acronyms uh, in the top row. And it shows, for instance, for North Europe, where I have the circle, it shows that um, temperature extremes, wet extremes do increase from 1,5 degree to 2 degrees. So there is a difference. Yes, we have more extremes if we're going from 1.5 to 2 degrees already. And in Central Europe, we had severe heat waves um, lately in the recent decades, also in Northern Europe. But, uh, and, but here I'm showing you to a study where, where they compared the, the mortality in two cities that were affected by the 2003 heat waves in, in, in Central Europe. And you see that if we're going uh, between 1.5 and 2 degrees, we see if we had the same heat wave as in 2003, we have 20, uh, we, I mean, we don't have the same, but the reference is the 2003 heat wave. And we, if we go to 2 degrees, we would have 22% more people uh, dying from the heat in London or 15% more in Paris, um, given the, the increase in temperatures. So yes, it matters if we have one, if we stay at 1.5 or below two degree. And that uh, these uh, have also effects on the sectors. And this is what's also assessed in this special report on 1.5 degrees, that this entangles the, uh, the risk from climate extremes to different sectors. And here you see uh, for in the gray line through these um, uh, red bars is our current climate, where for 
for, for instance, blue plotting, crop yields, heat related mortality, morbidity, tourism. We are still in a moderate risk currently, but you see that between 1.5 and 2 degrees, we are in a critical transition zone from going from moderate to high risk. And you have seen in the other graph, if we go even above 2 degrees, we are in very high to, uh, to in high to very high risk uh, from temperature extremes. So it, it is important that we mitigate uh, climate change or that we reduce greenhouse gas emissions to reduce the global warming below two degrees or even better below 1.5 degrees. But what does it take? I mean, you see here an animated graph and you see the historical emissions until now. And to, to basically to get to 1.5 degree by 2030, by 2040, or we would need to rapidly mitigate. And if we don't, that you see how the shift, the curve, if we delay the emission reduction, then the more we have to invest in negative emission, which is the green uh, uh, that appears, the later we uh, start with the mitigation, we have to uh, account for negative emissions, which we can achieve by carbon removal from the atmosphere. atmosphere. And there are different techniques, for instance, using forestry or land use changes to absorb carbon. We have carbon capture and storage to take out carbon from the atmosphere or other techniques, carbon dioxide removal. But technologies are not that advanced and they also consume a lot of energy. So, so we need to invest in this techno in technology. The, the, the more we delay the mitigation, uh, in order to keep the CO2 below. And just to give you an impression what it uh, means to reduce that drastically, the emissions uh, that we have now. We have this graph here from the COVID-related reduction in emissions, just related to the energy and industry sector, basically because we are not flying anymore. And we, um, we reduce the transport of goods uh, quite a lot because we are reducing our globalized world. Um, we had a reduction in the last year of five to seven percent in 2020. And that, of course, you see in the red, uh, little red uh, slope here, you see that would bring us exactly to on the track we would need in terms of emissions. But probably flying will pick up again, and then we are, we are most likely not on the track anymore that it would mean to reach 1.5 degree we would need the same reduction we had last year uh, five to seven percent every year the next 10 years so that's a tremendous effort we have to go for and uh, the stories we tell about this for instance Greta Thunberg just recently twittered that on current trends the probability of staying below two degrees of warming is only five percent but if all countries met their nationally determined uh, contribution, we could, uh, it rises to 26%. And then she writes, if that 26 was good. So it, we could, but also we could tell the same story, but with a little bit different angle is meanwhile, it is encouraging to see that some region reach deeper emission cuts than those projected by the same study less than four years ago. So yes, we are not yet there. We are not yet uh, there to really have this change in mitigation practices and policies. But yes, we are seeing that countries starting to make major steps to reduce their emissions. So um, it's so that, that because of this, um, uh, we are basically we are in a situation of urgency which this uh, graph has shown before uh, we are we need to mitigate fast and a lot um so but people that are thinking oh no uh, we are not yet there we, we never make it we not we never make it this uh, spurs uh, other technologies for instance uh, uh, geoengineering in terms of uh, solar radiate radiation management that has other that doesn't uh, uh, take, I mean, that doesn't take the problem at its heart, which are the CO2 emissions, but it, it just wants to relieve the symptoms, basically by shading sunlight from coming to the earth and then uh, reducing temperatures this way. But it doesn't 
uh, solve the problem itself. And these geoengineering uh, ideas are spurred by these, uh, we are in an emergency, we need to do something. But then I recommend reading this article um, that I brought out in 2015, that uh, these climate emergency framing will not justify geoengineering in terms of solar radiation management, the climate. We need to cure the, 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 the problem. We need to tackle the problem at the roots and not just cure the symptoms. And this is basically illustrating uh, what I mean. Uh, this is from the World Economic Forum Global Risk, a, a, trend map, a risk trend interconnection map. And you see that extreme weather events and climate change is only one element of a major systemic crisis we are in. Uh, there's many, many, many uh, issues at hand that come with our globalized world, with our way we are treating our people and the environment. And Karen O'Brien has put it basically in terms, we are in a relationship crisis. Um, and, and, and another person has just recently uh, um, said, Paul Raskin, in an article that the Anthropocene is we cannot see it just as a problem of climate because we could say the counterfactual if we just you know if all of a sudden a miracle happens and we take out all the CO2 and the climate crisis is gone are we safe no we are not safe we're still in a world that struggles with, with a lot of other issues and so Paul Raskin puts it we are actually in the planetary phase, the macro transition to an interdependent, superordinate global system. So it's a systemic crisis we are facing, and climate change or risk from extreme weather is just one of the symptoms of this um, crisis, systemic crisis. So it's good that we have the Paris Agreement. It's good that we are committed to reduce uh, climate change. But it is in the same year. Other agreements were also uh, made. It's the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction and the Sustainable Development Goals, which basically, if we, we're collaborating on all these issues, we can we are addressing the system and the, the, the major issues we are facing these days. Um, so because this these aspects of climate change sustainable development, disaster risk reduction, they're so interconnected. And solving one with the other will bring us to more sustainable solutions. So here we have a graph of showing how the Sendai framework goals, like understanding climate risk and, uh, and we saw disaster risk and uh, building more resilience and leaving no one behind is, is connected to the sustainable development goals like no poverty, sustainable cities, and climate action. And they have indicators to quantify our approach, our uh, progress in moving towards less disaster to a more resilient uh, world and also to a more sustainable world. And some of these uh, indicators are here listed in the middle. You see a lot of them are based on gross domestic product, uh, quantification of wealth uh, in terms of monetary wealth. Um, yeah. Um, so, and I give you an example uh, we studied in terms of heat wave risk, where are we using the concept of risk being the connection between weather, or climate, and vulnerability and exposure. And to quantify risk, to see how uh, we can change and, and, uh, and how risk is changing, we need to quantify uh, somehow. And of course, for the hazard, for heat waves, we have lots of climate models, we have observation data, we can quantify the hazard probability. But the, it, when we move to the consequences, to the impact, and we try to quantify vulnerability and exposure, it becomes more difficult. Exposure, yes, we have data for population density. We know where people live in urban or rural environment. Yes, but vulnerability is a very complex matter. And 
even at the same location, people have different age, gender, income, religion, education that makes them more vulnerable to the impact of a heat wave, for instance. So, but nevertheless, we try to quantify this using indicators in this paper, half a degree rapid socioeconomic uh, development matter for heat wave risk. And here we use the formula with an illustrative risk index at the global scale, uh, where we, we, we multiply the hazard probability times the uh, population and the vulnerability. And so what we, we looked at different scenarios for a one degree world and a two degree world and different development scenarios. For instance, the uh, sustainability world uh, and uh, inequality world. So, uh, so we have this. Uh, scenario matrix basically. And then we can look at the changes in heat wave probability and exposure for two degrees and one degree warming. On the top, you see one degree, uh, one and a half degree, and two degrees. We already have many, many more uh, uh, heat waves. So the, the likelihood for heat waves to occur is much bigger in a two degree warmer world. And a lot of these areas, for instance, when you look at India or Africa, you see that those uh, areas where the heat wave probability increases is also where a lot of people live. And then for the hum, uh, human, uh, for the vulnerability, we use a common index, the human development index, which is quali qualifying, quantifying the health, the education, and the standard of living of the population in the um, in an area. And you see uh, in the sustainability world, Africa, for instance, if you focus in the middle plot, is improving, moving more green instead of yellow from the present climate. But in the inequality world, you see that the conditions for instance for Africa are getting even worse. So if we look at our risk indicator, uh, basically uh, we have in the 1.5 degree world from a sustainable world to an inequality world, we don't see much difference in the heat wave risk. But if we move to um, from a, to a two degree world in an inequality uh, setting, development setting, we see that the risk for many regions like India and Africa, uh, where a lot of people live, will increase uh, significantly from, from 10 to 20 to 60 to 70 percent. But if you see for the same two degree warming, if we were going the sustainability pathway, we avoid a lot of the risk. Even though we encounter some of the warming, we still can avoid people being under risk because we are increasing uh, their um, resilience in terms of the increasing the we're decreasing their vulnerability to heat because they can afford, for instance, air conditioning, or they don't have to sleep and work on the street, or they don't so they have proper housing. So, so we, can, uh, we can do a lot by investing in sustainable development um, and well-being of the people, uh, even though if we are a little bit behind the mitigation, if it's slower than we actually think we need to go uh, in the terms of mitigation, we still need to mitigate but like a little bit with investing in human well-being and, and strengthening resilience and increasing or, or decreasing vulnerability to climate events. So this is uh, basically characterized by, by this uh, climate resilient pathways that have been shown in the working group two. Uh, basically, we have a choice and the choices, we have decision points. It's not now if we make the wrong decision, uh, then it's all lost. We have opportunities along the way to adjust, to learn, and to, to go towards uh, a high resilience and a low risk uh, world. But we need to have this vision. We need to have our will that we want to have a well being for everyone in a safe climate and environment. So that is also uh, captured in Terence O'Brien's uh, exploring the three fears of transformation is the 1.5 degree target possible. And if we only co concentrate on decarbonization pathways and low 
roadmap, then they treat often the climate change as a technical problem. Uh, net uh, emissions, uh, zero emissions, climate engineering, carbon removal, what can we do? But actually climate change is an adaptive challenge with practical, political and personal dimensions. And we need to engage people as agents of change. And that is critical to realizing the 1.5 degree target. And so, uh, so she, she, uh, she, she emphasizes that transformation is important and should not be forgotten in the, in the favor of technical solution and behavioral approaches. And that's what she explains in this, we need to embrace the three sphere, spheres of uh, transformation, basically beyond the technical responses and practical responses to climate change. Uh, we, we need to also tackle the political and system structures and the personal areas, the worldviews, the paradigm, just for instance, eating meat is right now a status in many regions or societies as a wealth, uh, but eating meat doesn't have to be a symbol for wealth. It could also be veganism and we would have a lot of uh, problems solved. So, so this, we need to embrace these three dimensions in order to change our system and exist in the world today and not be solved by the level of thinking that them, Albert Einstein said. And so we need global change or as Paul Raskin said, the great transition. And I want to close with this basically, uh, Paul Raskin's interrogating the Anthropocene uh, editorial because he puts this way uh, and I kind of Sympathize with this essential manifestation of a systemic crisis with many faces. And climate change is only one symptom. It is the inadvert outcome of historical past buffeted by choices, struggles, bifurcations that shaped the modern world. And he emphasizes that the Anthropocene story that we often tell in terms of geoengineering, emergency, and the sad logic of apocalypse is, is maybe in contraproductive. And we should move from the, basically the statement of Fogo, um, we have met the enemy and it is us, yes, but we should go to the great transition. We have met the solution and she is us. And so with this, I close my talk and my lecture.